Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Ivo Siegmann, and welcome to the first seminar in the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science in this new academic year. This seminar series is co-organized by the University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester, and Liverpool John Moores University, and today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University. And um, it will be presented today by Dr. Kit Yates from the University of Bath. We will make a start today, but instead of getting right into it with full speed, we will go a bit more slowly. So far, our next scheduled talk will only be in about a month's time. Um, that might change because I saw a lot of invitations going out. So, but um, so far, our next talk will be by uh, Dr. Linglong Yuan from uh, the University of Liverpool, and he will present his work on one of the classics in experimental evolution, the Lansky experiment. I would now like to introduce um, Kit. So first of all, Kit uh, told me that he originally is from Manchester. So giving this talk today is maybe a bit like a virtual journey back home. <laughs> um, but I think you did go to university in Oxford. So you studied mathematics there and also completed your PhD there with uh, Philip Maney, Ruth Baker and Radek Erban. And after your PhD, I think you, you did a postdoc there and then you went right to Bath. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, at the moment, uh, Kit is a senior lecturer in Bath, and um, he has worked on a variety of very interesting topics. So he has worked on cell migration, how patterns on skin first coats and uh, so on of different animals uh, develop, and I think also on locust swarms. Yeah. <laughs> so really everything. Um, he has also published uh, recently um, quite a few papers on strategies for dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And he has um, also worked a lot on making simulations of stochastic st spatial temporal systems more efficient. And I believe that is what you will be talking mostly about today. But one thing that really impresses me about Kit is that he has actually published a proper book so not like a PhD thesis, but a real book. <laughs> and it's not a standard textbook or something like that, but it's the maths of life and death. Yeah, good that you show it. Um, <laughs> I only have an electronic copy, so I have been reading this on a Kindle. Uh, and I think that if everyone had read chapter seven when the book was published, so that's the um, chapter on infections, maybe last year would have gone a bit differently. I, I have some suspicion that this might have improved things a bit. Yeah. So I now look forward to your talk on hybrid frameworks for modeling reaction diffusion processes. Great, thanks, Eva. Thanks for such a kind introduction. It's great to um, it's great to to give a virtual talk, at least to my to the northwest, to my my home region, which I still feel a very strong connection to. I uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm a big Man City fan, and we got hammered by PSG last night, so I am uh, a bit chagrin about that. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you a bit about these hybrid frameworks that we've been developing. I actually like to to use these talks as a sort of advert for more more generally what we're doing. So that if you're interested in any of the stuff that we do in in the group you can go and look at the papers and, and find out what's out there. So we'll talk a bit more in detail about these hybrid frameworks, but I'm gonna probably start by giving you an overview of what my group, the Mathematical Developmental Biology Group actually does. Uh, and then I'll give you some biological motivation for why we might want to develop these hybrid frameworks for reaction diffusion processes, but in particular for, for biological processes like modeling cell migration. And then I'll go ahead and tell you about these hybrid methods themselves. I'll start by talking about the different modeling paradigms you might use to represent reaction diffusion systems. And then I'll tell you about a couple of different hybrid methods that we've developed uh, and tell you where we're gonna go with this in the future. So firstly, the group that I work in, we have done, as Ivo said, a lot of work in a, a broad range of different areas from the way that locusts migrate and use noise to uh, enhance the amount of time that they can spend together to stabilize their swarms and how you might go about destabilizing them. We've done work on free swimming bacteria like E. coli or Rhodobacter spheroides where we've, uh, where we've tracked these bacteria and um, we've characterized their motion and then we've modeled that uh, and you know, classic classical um, persistent random walk models can be used to represent the sort of run and tumble motion that these bacteria do. 
Uh, and we try to, again, derive um, continuum models which might describe that behavior. And then more recently, as Abby mentioned, we've been working a bit more on COVID. So uh, I joined this group called Independent Sage, which are doing uh, communication of, of the ideas underlying the pandemic and policy advocacy. But my main role has been trying to explain the mathematics underlying the disease modeling that's been going on, doing a little bit of modeling myself. And um, yesterday, I'm really delighted to announce that I had a paper accepted in science on COVID, which is uh, like a massive deal. So I'm pleased that I can at least tell some people about it. Um, so that's some of the some of the stuff that we've been doing. I'm not going to speak about too much. Um, what we typically do, as, as the name of the group, the Mathematical Developmental Biology Group suggests, is look at developmental biology. So this first image here is supposed to represent um, modeling of zebrafish pigmentation patterns. So I do this work in collaboration with Robert Kelsch, who's a, a biologist here at the University of Bath, and also with a former PhD student that we shared, Jennifer Owen. Uh, and what we've been doing is try to build individual based models of the way that the three key chromatophores, the three key pigment cell types in zebrafish interact with each other. So you've got these yellow xanthophores, these black melanophores, and these iridescent shiny iridophores. Um, and we've been trying to build these individual based models of, of how they interact and how they spread out on a growing domain and how you can get these stripes forming. Um, in particular, we're also interested in making sure that we're not just modeling the wild type pattern, that we can also recreate mutants of these fish. So what happens when one of these cell types is missing? We can recreate the six single and double mutant um, fish as well using this, this model. And more recently, we've been looking at the impact of, of um, biased or anisotropic growth on these models and seeing how that impacts on the pattern, seeing whether we can make it more realistic. So there's a couple of papers. Um, down here, uh, the, the latter of which is being bounced around from journal to journal as it gets rejected, but hopefully eventually it will get accepted somewhere. Um, so that's that's some of the stuff on, on uh, pigment pattern formation, zebrafish. Um, because Jennifer has been working on these pattern formation models, we wanted to have a way of quantifying pattern formation. So as well as doing the sort of the, the dirty biology side of things, we also try and develop some theoretical tools which allow us to analyze our models in an objective way. So one of the tools that Jennifer, in collaboration with another PhD student, Enrico, has been developing is called a pair correlation function. So what this effectively does is it says, um, for a given cell in a, in, a, in a lattice, in this case, and this is a sort of pixelated image of a pattern, uh, for a given site in that in that lattice, uh, at a particular distance, am I more likely to be surrounded by sites of the same type or sites of a different type? So if the pair correlation function is above one, you're more likely to be surrounded by sites of the same type at a given distance. And if it's below one, you're more likely to be surrounded by sites of, of a different type um, at that particular distance. So here for this, uh, this spotty pattern, you can see that at short distances, the pair correlation function is high, which basically says if you're in the middle of one of these black dots, you're more likely to be surrounded by other black cells, or if you're in the middle of a white area here, you're more likely to be surrounded by white pixels. Uh, whereas at slightly larger distances, the pair correlation function is below one, which tells you that you're more likely to be anti-correlated at those distances. So black sites will be um, um, will have white sites surrounding them in the majority at that distance. Uh, so it sort of picks out the fundamentals of the of the patterns. And you could say, well, you know, I don't need you to tell me that this is clearly a spotty pattern. What have I gained? Well, firstly, you've quantified, quantified it objectively rather than just looking at it by eye. But I think in this lower example is where this pair correlation function really comes into its own. I think objectively, it's not easy to tell whether just by looking at it at short distances, there's correlation or anti-correlation between these sites. So you're more likely to be surrounded by a black site if you're another black site or, or a white site if you're another white site, or you're more likely to be surrounded by one of the opposite type. And actually what the pair correlation picks out is that at distance one on this irregular lattice, you're more likely to be surrounded by a cell or a site of a different color. Uh, and I don't think that's that obvious to see. And the reason that we know that this is the case is because the way that Enrico generated this pattern is he colored in all the lattice sites in black, and then he picked some out randomly and he denuded or he decolored the ones that neighbor it. So he generated anti-correlation at short distances and that's picked out by the pair correlation function, but I don't think it's that easy to see by eye. So you can use these things to characterize patterns 
objectively and, and we've been developing them uh, so that they work on lattice these are these tools have been developed for off lattice situations but we've been developing them for regular cubic square hexagonal triangular uh, lattices in two and three dimensions um another thing that we've been working on is modeling the cell cycle so this is with a collaborator at the university of lancaster who's whose name is richard mort um we are interested in understanding the way that cells proliferate and, and divide. What you're seeing here is a movie of, of a bunch of cells which are going through the cell cycle. They're, they're going through, they're getting larger in the green stage and then they divide into two uh, cells back in the red stage. They're, they're not stained, they are um, creating a fluorescent protein which allows them to be visualized and they fluoresce differently at different stages of the cell cycle. So the green cells are in um, the G1 phase and the uh, red cells are at a later stage in, in G2 and S and M phase of the cell cycle. Now, typically, um, so we can use these videos to have a look at what the cell cycle time distribution looks like. And, and this is what it looks like. So on the X axis here, I've got the cell cycle time in minutes and I've got the frequency or the probability of that occurring here. So this is the distribution of cell, cell cycle times or cell division times. Now, typically when people try to model cell proliferation stochastically, they reach for their favorite stochastic simulation algorithm, which is often the Gillespie algorithm. Uh, Gillespie algorithm is designed to simulate Markov processes. It uses exponentially distributed waiting times. It's a good model for chemical reaction systems. But it's actually not a very good model for cell cycle times. If you try to fit an exponential distribution to this cell cycle distribution, you can see it doesn't look very good. In particular, the exponential distribution says the most likely time for a cell to divide is immediately after it's just divided. And that clearly doesn't make any sense. There's loads of stuff that the cell has to do, DNA replication, DNA synthesis, DNA separation before it can divide again. Uh, and so actually what we come up with instead is a really simple adaptation of that is that you break the cell cycle down into a number of stages. These stages don't have to correspond to the phases of the cell cycle you break it down to a number of exponentially distributed stages. It's called the linear chain trick. It's a really well-known trick actually from epidemiology. Uh, but the idea is you have cells in stage X1 and they go into cells of stage X2 with rate lambda one, and they can go into cells of stage X3 with rate lambda two and so on. Uh, and you can change the distribution of the cell cycle. So if these lambdas are all different, actually you can get a very general type of distribution called a hyper-exponential distribution. But if they're all the same, then you get what's called an Erlang distribution. And actually that does a pretty good job of fitting to a wide range of different cell cycle times. So this is the fit of the Erlang distribution to this cell cycle data. It's not perfect, but it does a much better job than the exponential distribution would do. And the reason that this is important is because actually, if you just characterize the cell cycle distribution by looking at the mean cell cycle time and assuming that the distribution is exponential, then you get the wrong behavior out of your model. Okay, so we looked in particular at traveling waves and we found that the speed of the traveling wave is influenced by the cell cycle distribution. In particular, if you choose an exponentially distributed cell cycle, your wave goes faster than it should do, faster than it does if you choose an Erlang distributed cell cycle time. So it's important to get this right and to properly characterize your cell cycle time distribution. Um, and so the last thing I want to tell you about before I get onto the main meat of the of the talk is uh, about developing stochastic simulation algorithms. So we uh, use a lot of stochastic simulation, a lot of computation in our group. And because of that, we're always looking for ways to make our simulations more efficient. So we've been developing along with Chris Lester, who's a former PhD student, and, and Ruth Baker, who's um, in Oxford, my, again, my former PhD supervisor. Um, we have been developing what, um, what's called multi-level stochastic simulation, which can dramatically improve the speed of your stochastic simulations, as well as a couple of other methods, which are sort of cheats or hacks, which can help you accelerate um, the Gillespie algorithm, stochastic simulation algorithm for biological systems. And that's also what lies behind the, the main meat of the talk, which is about developing hybrid methods, which allow us to, to do spatially extended stochastic simulation more efficiently uh, without losing accuracy. So let's get on to the main bit of the talk then. So 
I'm interested in in biology. I'm interested in in mathematics as well, and and accelerating stochastic simulations. But I want to give you some motivation for why we want to do these hybrid methods. So, in particular, with my collaborator Richard up in Lancaster, I'm interested in modelling neural crest cells. So these are a group of cells of the early embryo. They contribute to a range of different tissues, parts of the bone, the gut, the eye, the heart. And in particular, for us, we're interested in skin and hair pigmentation. That's one of the big things we're interested in. And if something goes wrong with the migration of these neural crest cells in the early embryo, then it can give rise to, in fact, a whole range of different diseases, depending on which neural crest cell type it is that, that um, has the defect. So you can have things like Hirschsprung's disease, uh, which is a failure of your neuroblasts to properly colonize the gut. So you don't have proper innervation of the gut. And it means that your gut can't properly peristals or push food through the gut. So you get chronic obstructions and blockages in your gut. Um, and things that other diseases like neurofibromatosis, which is a predisposition to certain types of cancers. So it can be a range of, of different diseases, which range from, from mild diseases, which I'll tell you about in a second, all the way through to these more severe diseases. In particular, we're interested in melanocytes. So melanocytes are the cells which go on and produce pigmentation in hair and skin. Uh, in, in mammals anyway, other, other animals have, um, have more chromatophores, more pigment types, but as mammals, we just have this one melanophores, which produce uh, brown or, or, or black pig, or mostly brown, different shades of brown pigment. These melanocytes, um, they migrate from the back of the embryo, so just dorsal to the neural tube. The neural tube is this thing which goes on to become the spinal column effectively. They migrate from the back round to the front and in fact they, they, their aim is not well, their aim but the, they what they have to do in, in development is to fully colonize the developing epidermis we start with a very small number of cells about 20 odd cells here in this region called the migration staging area which is not exactly at the back of the embryo it's slightly offset um, but it's very close to the to the um the dorsal end so the uh, yeah the dorsal end of the embryo and they try to migrate throughout the whole embryo over a five day period between embryonic day 10 and a half and embryonic day 15 and a half. And they have to be in place so that they can then localize to hair follicles at that point. And so this is sort of um, side on view of the embryo. These are the cells migrating through the region that we're interested in. It's called the trunk between the limbs here. Um, and uh, this is the view of a cross section. Uh, and you can see they, they, they go from where the neural tube is round uh, between the somites and the developing skin and they go round the embryo like that. So why are we interested in melanocytes? Well, melanocytes, because they produce pigment in the skin, they give a very clear um, phenotype if there's a problem. So there is, there's a, a whole range of different mutations you can have which cause, cause a pathology called piebaldism, which you might have heard of in the context of uh, other animals. Uh, and it's pigmentation defect, which means that we can we can see it very easily without having to do invasive investigations or experiments to to, to spot it. Uh, it's also non-fatal, which means we can see what happens to these mice, mice of the the animal that we we do the experiments on as they as they grow into adulthood. And the point is, we might say, well, you know, what's what's the deal? Why are you investigating these cells if they're not that important and their pathology isn't that important? But the, the point is that they're a model for other more serious types of neural crest cell migratory defect, the other, the other types and other diseases that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. So if you have a mutation in a gene called KIT, which uh, is sort of an unfortunate name, uh, although it could be viewed as fortunate, sometimes I pretend that I discovered this gene myself. It's not true, I should point out. Um, but if you have a mutation in this gene, one of a number of mutations, then um, it can give rise to uh, a white spotting phenotype. So here you can see it in the baby, you get this belly spot and also this forehead spot. And here you can see it in the mouse as well. You probably will have seen it in, in horses, which have uh, often a white spot on their nose. Cows are often piebald um, and cats. Uh, if you've ever seen a tuxedo cat like Tom from Tom and Jerry or Sylvester from Sylvester and Tweety, uh, they have a kit mutation. They're, they're called tuxedo cats because they have this white belly and this black coat, if you like. Uh, so they are all uh, typically kit mutations. And what happens with this kit mutation is it means that the melanoblasts, the pigment cells, they fail to, to colonize the embryo as it develops. Um, and so you get these white spotting phenotypes. 
Rarely you do see wild type mice, so mice without the mutation, which have this white spotting phenotype as well. Um, and occasionally you see mice which do have the mutation, which also have a back spot as well as just a belly spot. So they have they have a spot at either either side. So we'll look out for those in, in what we're doing in a second. Now there's quite a lot of biological controversy around how these belly spots um, uh, occur. Typically, um, people, biologists would see would have seen this this spotting pattern and suggested that the reason why you get this white belly spot at the front of the embryo is because the cells trying to get from the back to the front just don't migrate fast enough. They just don't get there in time. But actually, when our collaborator Richard did what's called ex vivo experiments, so he takes sections of the skin uh, and he puts them under the microscope. What he saw was that these cells were actually, um, if anything, migrating faster in the kit mutant mice, but they just weren't proliferating as fast. They weren't dividing as fast. So the hypotheses that we wanted to put into a model were that, firstly, that wild type colonization could be explained by a really simple mechanism, which is just the random migration or diffusion of cells in combination with these cells dividing, proliferating, and the domain growing over time. You can see this is two different stages of the embryo here, a very early stage and a more advanced stage, and you can see that uh, it's changed in size a great deal. In particular, our collaborators suggested that there were no complicated cell-cell interactions, so no nothing other than cells bumping into each other and excluding volume, no repulsion, no attraction, and that there are no external signaling gradients guiding the cells where to go to tell them to go from the back to the front. And it probably makes sense because really you want a homogeneous distribution of pigmentation pattern uh, eventually. And so diffusion is a sensible way to try and achieve that homogeneous distribution. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, the, the last hypothesis that we wanted to test with our model was that these white belly spots are caused not by impaired, prolif um, not by impaired migration, but instead by impaired proliferation. These cells are just not proliferating fast enough. There just aren't enough of them to colonize the domain. It's not that they weren't moving fast enough. So we tried to build a really simple model of this process called a volume exclusion process model. So the way it works is we, um, we took the domain that we were interested in from the back to the front and between the limbs, and we sort of unwrapped it into a rectangle shape. We put it down on the desk and we split it up into a number of different boxes, a lattice, if you like. And then we put cells on the lattice to mimic the initial condition where these cells started off at the migration staging area at the back of the embryo. And we give them a few rules about how they could move. And we parameterized the, the movement rule according to experimental data. So this movement rule, for example, if you have a cell in this current configuration, it can try to move to, if it gets selected to move, it can move to one of its four neighboring sites uh, in the next time step. The only caveat to that is that if there's a cell already in the site that it's trying to move to, then that movement event gets aborted. So that means that you have some density dependent movement behavior. Similarly for proliferation, if this is your initial configuration here, if a cell gets chosen to proliferate, then it can place a daughter cell at one of its four neighboring sites with equal probability. Um, and again, the caveat is that if you have a cell already in the site that you're trying to proliferate into, then that proliferation event gets aborted. So again, we have some density dependent behavior of proliferation as well. And the last rule that we tried to implement is a domain growth rule. So to keep things simple, we wanted to maintain a rectangular shaped domain. So in order to do that, we said, well, we're gonna allow growth, but we're gonna allow growth of a whole row or a whole column at a time. So if I wanted to implement a growth event in the horizontal direction, what I'd have to do is choose um, from each row, choose a column uniformly at random from amongst the, the rows, so that's these green sites, and that's gonna be my site that gets chosen to grow. And when a site grows, then what it does is it pushes, it inserts a new empty site in the current site, and it pushes everything along to the right. So here, this is supposed to indicate that the site that was chosen to grow contained a cell already. So again, insert an empty site there, push everything along to the right. And the same here, this was an empty site that gets chosen to grow, insert another empty site, push everything along to the right. And so we can grow and maintain this rectangular shape and we have an analogous situation for growth in the vertical direction. So that's it. 
this is this is a really simple model which we can we can parameterize experimentally and then we can start to ask questions about what is going on in this embryo and we asked lots of interesting questions i'm not going to tell you about all of them you can have a look in the paper that's referenced at the bottom here but in particular we wanted to investigate this biological controversy about whether um, the lack of colonization or the colonization success was dependent more on proliferation or on migration. So what we did is we um, looked at changing the mean cell cycle time for these cells. When you had the mean cell cycle time as the wild type, then what we saw was good colonization of the domain. So this is now looking from dorsal to ventral to dorsal, so back to front to back, so the whole round of the trunk region that we're interested in. And when we use the correct wild type cell cycle time, we get good colonization of the domain. When we reduce that proliferation rate or increase the cell cycle time by just an hour to make it nine hours, then we start to see these belly spots occurring in, in the mouse, so these regions where this pigment cells just don't manage to reach. Similarly, when we increase it to 10 hours, the belly spots get worse, they get bigger. And when you increase it to 11 hours, then you start to see back spots as well. So I did mention that occasionally with these mutants, you see these back spots where the cells fail to backfill uh, in the, in the, from the migration staging area. So you see these back spots as well. What happened when we changed the migration rate, and I haven't got the, the images here, but we found that we could significantly reduce the migration rate by up to an order of magnitude. And as long as we have the state, the correct wild type cell cycle time, we still got good colonization of the domain. So it hinted at least that this system, as we've modeled it, is far more sensitive to changes in proliferation than it is to changes in migration, which, which hinted that, that it was proliferation which was causing these belly spots to occur. So that was one of the findings from this, from this paper. And you can have a look at the paper and find out a bit more detail on that if you'd like. I've presented a very unnuanced version here. But I saw, I mentioned in passing that what we were looking at here is, is mouse embryos, not human scale simulations. And actually we've started to do simulations in, in cows because cows have apparently commercially valuable pigmentation patterns. Um, so people are interested in how cows get their patterns and how they can change those patterns. And so the question is, how do we scale up from Vitruvian mouse to Vitruvian man when we're doing these computational simulations. And so this is sort of motivation for why we need these hybrid methods to try and accelerate the, um, the simulation of our stochastic models. So this is the second part of the talk. I'm going to talk about building these hybrid models for reaction diffusion processes. So first I want to tell you about the different modeling paradigms that we might use to represent reaction diffusion processes in general. So at the coarsest scale, we might typically consider partial differential equations. So these were made famous in Manchester, in fact, um, in particular by Alan Turing for his uh, reaction diffusion, uh, diffusion driven instability mechanism of pattern formation, which, is, which has actually been a driver of a lot of mathematical biology in the last 70 years. Um, so partial differential equations model the density of whatever it is you're considering as a continuum. Um, they have advantages in that you can sometimes do mathematical analysis with them to understand what's going to happen to that model without even having to simulate it. You can do bifurcation analysis, you can, you can do in stability analysis and understand what's going to happen with these systems. If you are going to simulate them, then they have the advantages of being computationally tractable. Typically, there's hundreds of years of work on how to simulate partial differential equations. Um, so actually, we can we, we have a relatively good grip on these. The problem with these models is that they're very coarse. They don't capture the individual-based nature of, in particular, cell migration processes, for example. And partial differential equations are also not stochastic, so you don't get the noise behavior, which can be important, as I sort of hinted at uh, with, the, um, with the cell migration traveling wave example uh, earlier on in the talk. So advantages and disadvantages. The next finest scale we, what we call the meso scale, the PDE is typically we call the macro scale. The meso scale, we take the lattice, so to take the domain we're interested in, I'm just going to describe one dimensional examples here, and we break it into a number of boxes. So we have this lattice based process. We put cells on the lattice and we allow them to jump left and right with given rates. They can respond to each other, they can exclude volume, they can respond to chemical, external chemical signaling gradients, and we can, we can capture 
interesting individual based behavior. So they have the advantage that we can now relate these models to what the experimental data was actually telling us about individuals. We have noise related behavior. But of course, the disadvantages are that these are more computationally intensive and also to some degree still quite unrealistic in that cells don't actually just move around on a lattice. It's just a modeling convention. So again, advantages and disadvantages. Um, we can extend these models by in considering what's called volume exclusion uh, so that you have a finite capacity for each one of these boxes. So if that capacity is one, then that's what we call the fully volume excluding model. And that's exactly what I just showed you before when we were modeling the mouse embryos. Each site can only have a maximum of, of one cell or one particle in it at any one time point. Um, but we can try and accelerate those models by saying, well, let's allow the boxes to be twice as big and then we can fit twice as many cells in there, but the cells don't have to jump as far this time. So we do fewer jumps and the jumps are further. So we can significantly accelerate those stochastic simulation algorithms, or we can make it even bigger, or we say, let's make the boxes four times as big and say there are four times as many cells in there. We have to change the rates at which they jump to account for the uh, exclusion of volume, but we can accelerate simulations like that. So again, there's a sort of a gradient of most accurate uh, to least accurate, but most computation intensive to least computation intensive within these fully volume excluding or within these volume excluding models. So that's a sort of side note for these on lattice position jump processes. Going back up to the top, the last and finest paradigm we would consider, we often call the meter scale model, uh, is an off lattice position jump process. So now particles are modeled as individuals, often points, but sometimes as hard spheres, uh, and they can move around according to some stochastic differential equation or some other. Um, biased or unbiased uh, random walk that we might choose to represent uh, the, the, the biological process that we're modeling. Again, these probably have the advantage that they're, they're probably the most biologically realistic. Um, we can relate them most directly to what's going on experimentally, but they're typically the most expensive models as well. So um, we have to often, especially if we're thinking about volume exclusion or reactions between these particles, then we have to think of where they are in relation to each other. And if we have n particles, then we have to do n squared operations to find out how close they are to each other each time step. And that can be computationally intensive, although there are ways of speeding that up. So overall, the picture is we have this gradient across the top three layers of modeling from macro to micro where I should do it on, with the mouse so you can see what I'm doing from macro to micro, where we have most computationally, uh, or least computationally expensive to most computationally expensive, but least realistic to most realistic uh, sort of gradients going across from left to right. And what we really want to do is to try and exploit the complementary advantages of these two models. So the example I typically think of is, is of a traveling wave. At the front of the traveling wave where your population is, is low numbers and in a pulled front, that's where the wave speed is determined, you want to get your modeling right. So you probably want to use your finest scale or a finer scale model to make sure you get the wave speed right. But actually at the back of the wave where you've reached carrying capacity, there's very little point in having an individual stochastic based model back there where cells are just jumping back and forth between boxes or just running back and forth doing their random walk. Really what you can get away with back there is having a partial differential equation, which just basically sits at steady state and doesn't really do much, but it saves you a lot of computational effort of trying to model these individuals. So the question is, how do I couple these two or three or multiple different modeling paradigms together in order to get an efficient stochastic simulation? So this is a summary of some of the different um, hybrid couplings that have been developed partly by uh, my group and partly by other groups. So we can model, uh, I didn't mention these um, non-local jumping, so you can allow cells to jump further than just their neighboring box, which again accelerates things. You can couple local and non-local jumping together. You can couple fine, uh, fully excluding volume exclusion processes and partially excluding volume exclusion processes. You can couple PDEs to these compartment-based methods, PDEs to Brownian methods, and finally compartment-based methods to Brownian methods. And I'm gonna tell you about um, a couple of these, uh, these upper two, in fact, uh, but we've developed methods for coupling all three as it happens. So here's just three examples of these hybrid methods, and I'll try and explain them in a little, little detail, but not too much as to, to scare you, but enough that you can get the picture of, of what's going on. So 
again, just doing one dimensional examples, I'm copying a PDE on the left to a compartment based method on the right. So on the right, I divide my domain omega C for compartment into K different boxes. And I place A1 cells in this box, A2 in this one, and AK in the last one, and so on. The boxes are of width H. On the left hand side, I have a partial differential equation in omega P, P for PDE. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's a reaction diffusion equation uh, and the reactions correspond to whatever reactions I try to implement in this individual based method. So the question is, I allow this to, you know, I allow this PD regime to update according to my favorite numerical method. I allow particles to jump left and right between these boxes. How do I turn PDE mass into compartment based mass into individuals and how do I turn individuals back into PDE mass? And so what we came up with is, is this idea of what's called a pseudo compartment. So in this region, just to the left of this interface between the two domains, we have what's called a pseudo compartment. Um, it's denoted C minus one here. It's the same width as all the compartments in the compartment based domain. The idea is in here, not only does the mass evolve according to the PDE, according to whatever numerical simulation method that I want to use, but it also has the possibility of evolving as if these, the mass in here were particles as well, as if it was just another compartment in the compartment based regime. So we calculate how many pseudo particles there are in this regime by just integrating over the PDE solution in that region. And then we allow these pseudo particles to jump out of the box and equivalently particles to jump into the box as if it were just a compartment based method. So if a particle jumps in from this last box in the compartment based regime, then all we do is we add a step function, a heavy side function or boxcar function of mass equally across this pseudo compartment region uh, to the PDE solution. And then we just carry on with the PDE solution uh, as, as it were, according to the numerical method that we've chosen. Similarly, if a particle gets chosen or pseudo particle gets chosen to jump out of this region, then we place it in this box on the right hand side of the interface and we just remove a step function's worth of mass from the PDE solution and then we carry on with the PDE solution as we were. So that method works quite well and I'll show you some simulations of that to prove that it does work in, in a second, but I just want to tell you about a couple more methods before we get there. This next one is called flux balancing. So this time instead of having a single interface, we've got two interfaces. And actually a region, it's not usually just two boxes, it's usually M boxes, but I'm just showing two here for simplicity. We have a region between these two interfaces uh, where both regimes exist and model part of the mass. So the PDE models part of the mass here and the compartments model part of the mass. And the, the, the two things we need to do are to implement a boundary condition on the PDE at this point and to implement some flux boundary condition on the compartment based method at this point. So to implement the PDE boundary condition, we just look at the number of particles in this box and the number of pseudo particles in this box, and we just pin the PDE to be the right height here. So A minus one plus A one over two. So just the average of those two. And then here we look at the gradient of the PDE and say, well, what flux should be flowing into the compartment based method according to the PDE? And um, in, that, in, in that way, we can decide how many particles we need to add or remove if the gradient is negative from the, the pseudo compartments here uh, in order to get that flux correctly. So in this region, we're modeling the mass both as PDE and as a uh, compartment based method. So that flux balancing also works quite nicely and resolves some of the issues from the previous method. And the last one I'll tell you about is a method for coupling PDE to Brownian. So in some senses, these are the most disparate regimes. The PDE is the, is the coarse macro scale, the Brownian is the fine micro scale. And so in order to couple them together, we cheat. Or in some senses, we cheat and we put the meter scale model in between the two of them. So here we've got a sort of pseudo compartment. Here we've got another sort of pseudo compartment. We call them auxiliary regions in this case. So this one is treated in the same way as the pseudo compartment method to find the number of particles we just integrate over the PDE. Here, to find the number of pseudo particles, we just sum over the number of actual particles in that box. In the Brownian based method, they actually have their own individual positions, but in, in this compartment, they're just assumed to be homogeneously spread across the compartment. And then all we do is just allow particles to jump left and right according to the compartment based method in this short regime near the interface. Uh, and that allows us to convert Brownian particles into PDE and PDE back into Brownian particles. When a PDE particle jumps over the interface, we have to instantiate 
where the new Brownian base particle is. So we just choose the position uniformly. Similarly, when we choose to move a particle for, oops, when we choose to move a particle out of this box into the PDE regime, then we have to remove one of these particles chosen uniformly at random. And again, we have to do the same thing that we did to the PDE, either adding or removing a, a heavy side or boxcar function uh, corresponding to the mass of one particle to the PDE. So those are three methods. I've just sketched them, haven't give you any of the, of the real gritty detail, but I want to show you that they actually work. So this is for the first method that I showed you, the pseudo compartment method. When we test these things, I like to give them to my, um, often to my master's students, occasionally to starting off PhD students to see uh, how they get on with them. And typically the first thing I tell them to do is to model um, a uniform gradient. So just maintaining a uniform gradient. So if we're just doing diffusion, no reactions, then we should just be able to maintain a uniform gradient. And it's amazing how often you see a disparity. You can clearly see the interface when people don't code these things up incorrectly. So the first test of our method is, can we maintain a uniform profile when half the mass is modeled according to the PDE and half according to the compartment-based method? And so hopefully, oops, hopefully by showing you this movie, you uh, get the idea that um, you can. So here, the blue bars are the number of particles in the compartment-based method. The wiggly blue line is the PDE solution. It's slightly stochastic because it has a stochastic boundary condition because it's touching these particles here. And the red line is the curve that we would expect to see from the homogeneous solution to a corresponding partial differential equation, just a homogeneous solution. Uh, so we can maintain a uniform particle, uh, a uniform uh, gradient, and uh, we can just characterize the error in these stochastic simulations by saying how much mass is in the PD regime at any one point, how much mass is in the compartment-based regime. Although it looks like it's gone slightly biased towards the PDE here, if you run this for longer, then it, it just oscillates up and down. There's no clear bias. Uh, to mass be in one regime or the other. So that's sort of what we're looking for when we do these simulations. The next simulation is um, to, to test that we can correctly manage the flux over the boundary. So with diffusion, this is a sort of extreme test of flux where we just put all the mass in uh, the PD half of the domain to start with and let it flow until we get a uniform steady state. Uh, and so hopefully, again, you'll see that um, the, the red line here is the analytical solution of a corresponding uh, diffusion PDE with that initial condition. And you can see that the, the blue curve is the PDE and, and the heights of the bars are matching that red analytical solution really quite nicely as we head towards that uniform steady state. And again, you can characterize this by looking at the errors, the amount of mass in each region. So again, this time um, we start the mass in each region, well, in the PD region starts at one and decays down to a half, and then the mass in the compartment-based region increases from zero to a half, and you can see that these curves, the red curve is the, um, is, is the analytical solution, the black curve is the average over a number of repeats of our hybrid method, and you can see they agree quite nicely. And again, here, this is called, this is a relative error, so I've taken the red curve, subtracted the black curve, and divided by the red curve, the, the, red, the height of the red curve to, to get some sort of normalized relative error. And again, you can see that it just tends to oscillate around zero. There's no, uh, there's no bias in these solutions. The last one I'm gonna show you because I've got to finish up in a second is this morphogen gradient formation. So this is the, the corresponding PDE. I've got diffusion and degradation. I've also at the left-hand boundary got an influx with rate lambda. And at the right-hand boundary, I've got zero flux boundary conditions. And the initial condition is that domain is just completely empty. Uh, and you can see, again, that uh, the, the, um, after a while, the, the curves seem to marry up as we approach this steady state. What I had sort of slightly hidden here is that if you look early enough in the simulation, you start to see a bit of a problem. You see a divergence from the, uh, the, the analytical solution of the, of the PDE and the hybrid method. And the reason for this is that actually, in order to move a particle out of the pseudo compartment, out of the PDE, you have to have at least one particle's worth of mass in there. Otherwise, you end up having negative particle numbers and everything goes to the wall. Uh, so you get a slight delay in or a sort of retardation of the flux across the boundary in this original method that I told you about, which is a bit of a problem. You don't really want to have that. And you can see that actually occurring when you look at the mass. It looks okay for the amount of mass in the PDE region, but when you look at the amount of mass in the compartment-based region, you can see that clearly we don't start getting mass in the, in the um, compartment-based region until after we should do according to the analytical solution. 
Fortunately, we have got a, um, an adaptation of our pseudo compartment method, which deals with that situation when you have low particle numbers near the boundary, which allows you to correct for that. And so this is the, the corresponding plots from the corrected algorithm. The other things to say are um, that really you shouldn't be using your hybrid method when you've got low particle numbers at the boundary, because then your, your, compart your PDE, your coarse scale method is hard to justify. Really, you should be using your compartment based method. And to do that, you need to introduce the idea of an adaptive interface, which is something we've also done, but uh, I won't dwell on here. So where are we going in the future with this? Well, we're always developing different coupling methods. The great thing about this area is there's lots of different regimes. I haven't talked about stochastic partial differential equations. I haven't talked about molecular dynamics at the other end. So there are always different methods to couple and different ways of coupling. It's actually a really interesting area of maths that allows you to be super creative with, with what you're doing and how you couple these things together. It requires a bit of, um, I don't know, not, not typical mathematical thinking, a bit of, of, um, of maybe more, more artsy thinking, although, of course, people will tell you that mathematical thinking is incredibly creative, whatever area you're working in. One problem that we come across quite a lot is when we couple the PDEs to the compartment-based methods, we tend to get um, a problem with the variance, like the PDE takes on some of the stochasticity of the compartment-based method, and consequently, the compartment-based method is sort of damped by being coupled to this deterministic PDE, so you don't get the right variance. You might get the right first moment, but you don't get the right second moment. And so one of the things that we're going to try and do is is to um, correct for that variance. We've got a number of ideas about how to do that because actually the variance uh, is important. We'd like to try and apply this to real biological scenarios, to real biological situations. Um, we've started work with a group in Nottingham looking at ion channels um, and trying to model the area near an ion channel using a very fine base model, but the area away from the ion channel using a coarser model where you don't need the exact detail. In that case, the motivation is having exact spatial resolution, even though the concentration of particles near the ion channel might be higher than further away, the motivation is just to have a small region around the ion channel, which is modeled accurately because the spatial position of the particles really matters in terms of them binding to the, the ion channels and getting through there. And then the last thing is reducing reliance on these interfaces. In some senses, coupling these two methods together is a little bit clunky, especially when you've got an interface, you need to then make the interface move. And if you're thinking about doing you know, stochastic reaction diffusion pattern formation, then you need to have multiple interfaces where if you've got an oscillating pattern, you're going to have to have regions of high and low particle density. It might be that they don't overlap between different species. So it starts to get complicated. And so what we're working on at the moment is to try to have a method of, of removing the reliance on these interfaces and having uh, the whole domain being modeled partly by one regime and partly by the other and, and switching between the two different regimes on a dynamic basis. So that's it for me. Um, we've got a few minutes to, to answer questions. Uh, this is thanks to everyone who's who's chipped into this work. And, um, and I'll say thanks to you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kit, for your great talk. Um, I also would like to say, if you have a question, then <clears throat> please um, ask quickly, because um, Kit has to leave um, really urgently at 2 PM, unfortunately. So um, if you want to ask a question, you can either um, unmute yourself or ask um, a question in the chat. Um, while we are waiting, uh, maybe I could ask a question. Um, so um, you mentioned that um, you would like to capture low particle numbers um, at the front of the waves. And you said that it's uh, important to capture stochastic effects due to these low particle numbers. So um, in which applications would um, stochastic effects be um, really important? So what, would, what difference would it make um, if you have a more accurate representation of um, low particle numbers at the front of a wave? Yeah, so this is one, it sort of goes back to, um, to the this, this thing I was saying quite near the start about how if you've got a traveling wave, uh, of cells, for example, like the cells moving across the, the embryo uh, in, in the mouse, for example, where you've got proliferation and random migration, the underlying assumption of a PDE model is that um, cell cycle times or proliferation events are exponentially distributed. That's the assumption you need to use in order to get to, as well as using a mean field moment closure assumption, that's the assumption you need to use in order to get to the classical Fisher um, KPP um equation 
so if you use the, your um, if you use that partial differential equation alone, then you will not get the wave speed of that wave correct. You need to use an individual based model which corrects for or allows for the correct cell cycle distribution. Um, and so I think that's one example where it can be important to have stochastic effects. That's not to say that you can't derive an appropriate set of PDEs which properly account for uh, the cell cycle distribution you can do, uh, but uh, certainly if you're interested in, in stochastic effects like um, the first time a cell reaches a particular um, position uh, on the domain, the first cell to get to the end, then you really do need to have an individual-based uh, stochastic model to account for that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I don't see uh, another question yet. So uh, that's fine. probably that means that I should go on. <laughs> yeah. So um, when uh, you presented this work, I think initially you um, talked about um, growing domains. Uh, can these uh, methods for coupling the different uh, modeling methods be easily used on growing domains as well? Or is that something that is, um, yeah, probably going to be a lot more complicated? They can be used on growing domains. Okay. Easily is uh, not the right word though. So I, uh, Cam, I don't, I don't think I mentioned Cameron. Actually, Cameron's my PhD student who's done a lot of this this work. He developed the auxiliary region method. I started a master's project with him five, six years ago, where I thought it would be quite easy. Just, we'll, I said, you know, we'll just do the hybrid methods that exist, and we'll do them on growing domains. It'll be easy because I've done some stuff on growing domains and how you derive the, the appropriate PDE for domain growth on a on a um, uh, versus a compartment based model. So I thought we've got these paradigms. We'll just couple them together. And it turned out to open just all sorts of cans of worms, both with the individual based methods not actually being correct on their own, but also the coupling of them uh, being incredibly difficult to, to do. So they can, and we've written, we have eventually written a paper where we've coupled all three of these methods together on growing domains, but it's not, it's not simple to do in most cases, it's, it, or at least it requires us to do a lot of new theory in order to get there. Now that we've done that, it, you know, it can be applied relatively straightforwardly, but it, it's not super intuitive as the, you can't just cut and paste in the same way that you expect to do in the, uh, in the static case, the domain growth case is significantly more complicated, but yeah, there is a, there's a paper out there now, which was accepted last year, I think, which covers all of those different domain growth methods. Um, <laughs> I still haven't seen another question, uh, so maybe I um, ask uh, my last question and then I, I let you go, okay? <laughs> so um, you did mention that you use the Erlang distribution um, to replace um, the exponential distribution, and you said that it didn't uh, work uh, perfectly. So, I mean, maybe my, my question is more um, like a comment. So, um, have you looked at other so-called uh, face type distributions? So, I think the um, Erlang distribution is a special case of a class of distributions that you can derive from um, looking at a Markov model with an absorbing state and gives you um, probably one of the most general classes of waiting time distributions. So what maybe, so this is in a way <laughs> where I get to my question, what uh, potentially um, other phase type distributions um, work better? Yeah, um, so it's a really, really good point. So I, I briefly mentioned hypo exponential distributions, which are more general than Erlang, but less general than phase type. Phase type is, yeah, like you said, the most general uh, type of distribution. Uh, we have thought about that. The, the problem is after you, so the, when you go beyond um, two or three parameters in these models, it becomes very sloppy to fit the actual parameters. So we did consider exponentially modified Erlang where you have all the rates the same apart from one, and then you have three parameters. Um, but even then it becomes quite sloppy. And then as soon as you make you know, all the rates different, then there's just no way of accurately, uh, accurate, accurately fitting or, or being confident about your parameters, maybe that doesn't matter. I mean, it depends what your application is. Maybe if you if you just care about getting the cell cycle distribution correct, then why not go for 
um, you know, hypo exponential, which I think is dense in the set of all unimodal distributions. So if you've just got a unimodal distribution, you can fit it perfectly. But of course, you, you know, ideally you do want to be relating this back to experimental data, which is why we typically restrict ourselves to these um, Erlang or exponentially modified Erlang, which have just two or three parameters, because we know that we can get those out relatively easily. But yeah, phase, phase type is another is another extension on that. And actually, I think um, Martin, uh, I think Martin Garcia Lopez, maybe in Leeds. I forget. I forget if that's his actual name, but I think that's his name. Uh, is has been working on these phase type distributions. So um, so yeah, he's been. I think he's followed up on our on our, our linear chain trick paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think now it's it's um, two o'clock, and I would like to thank you very much again for um, your talk and being so quest uh, so patient with my questions. Um, I would like to thank everyone in the audience um, for attending. I will give you a virtual clap, so I think some others are doing the same. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I hope to see you all again for um, the next talk by uh, Ling Long Yuan in about a month or something earlier if it comes wrong. So uh, keep uh, yeah listening to our um, invitations. So um, to all of you, have a nice day, and um, I hope you will have good have a good quiz with your um, first year students. <laughs> uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed they play the game. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot to all of you. Bye bye. Well, see. You.